we go. Dear friends in Christ, welcome to worship this second Sunday in the season of Lent. Only a couple of announcements today that I am aware of. First off is that we'll be back with you tomorrow morning, um, somewhere between 9 and probably 10, 1030, with our daily devotions. And Wednesday evening, soup supper, even though we're not going to be here and we're not going to have soup, we will have worship to you at 7 o'clock from Luther Hall, our healing service. So if you're at home, out and about in the world, grab yourself some soup, sit down, and join us for worship. If you would, please stand as we prepare our hearts for worship during this season of Lent. Let us worship God who has done great things. Rejoice in our God who made us as we are. Let us worship God who has caused streams of mercy to flow in the wasteland. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. I invite you to kneel as you are able for confession and forgiveness. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy, and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and the power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able in body or in spirit. The Lord be with you. The prayer of the day is a prayer for the second Sunday in Lent. Please pray with me. Eternal God, it is your glory always to have mercy. Bring back all who have erred and strayed from your ways. Lead them again to embrace in faith the truth of your word and to hold it fast. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated as we hear the word of God. When Abram was 99, oh, Old Testament reading is from Genesis 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Holy wisdom, 
holy word. We're going to read Psalm 22, 22 through 30 responsively. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line give glory. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow before him. The kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone, all who sleep in the earth bow down to in worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. Blessed are those who hope in him. My soul shall serve him. They shall be known in his glorious power. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. Here ends the psalm. The epistle comes from Romans 4. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be their heirs, faith is null and the promise is void, for the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words it was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, for, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who has handed over to the death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Holy wisdom, holy word. The Holy Gospel today comes from the Gospel of St. Mark. I would ask the congregation to rise as you're able, in body or in spirit. This gospel needs a little bit of context, and so I'm going to read the entire passage, um, backing up just a few verses into verse 27, to put everything in context, but I'm going to read from the message. Um, You may not be able to quite follow along in your bulletin. Jesus and his disciples headed out for the villages around Caesarea Philippi. As they walked, Jesus asked them, Who do people say that I am? Some say John the baptizer, they said. Others say Elijah, and still others say one of the prophets. Jesus then asked, and you, who do you say that I am? Peter answered for the crowd, you are the Christ, the Messiah. Jesus warned them to keep it quiet, not to breathe a word of it to anyone. He then began to explain things to them. It's necessary that the Son of Man proceed to an ordeal of suffering, 
he tried, found guilty by the elders, high priest, and religious scholars. He killed, and after three days, rise up alive. He said it simply, so they clearly couldn't miss his point. But Peter grabbed him in protest, turning and seeing his disciples wavering, wondering what to believe. Jesus confronted Peter. Peter, get out of my way. Satan, be gone. You've no idea how God is working. Calling the crowd to join his disciples, Jesus says, Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way. My way to saving yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose the real you? What could you ever trade your soul for? If any of you are embarrassed over me and the way I'm leading, when you get around your fickle and unfocused friends, know that you'll be an even greater embarrassment to the Son of Man when he comes again in all the splendor of God, his Father, with his army of holy angels with him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Congregation may be seated, and we will sing together, Were You There? Most biblical scholars believe that Mark was the first gospel written. 
We believe in marking priority and that Matthew and Luke had Mark's gospel and some other things distinct to themselves and a couple of things in common for other sources. And then John's gospel, well, John's gospel is just kind of out there doing the John thing. It's why it's my favorite gospel. But I love Mark's telling of the story of Jesus as it leads to the cross. Because Mark is the gospel of urgency. It's the shortest of all the gospels. Today, I wanted to put in context what was going on with Peter. Because one of the things that that I find when we start going in this journey of Lent, especially when we get into Holy Week, is there is that little part of many Christians that get just a wee bit self-righteous. We look back on 2020 vision and we know that what happens on Good Friday and in the silence of Holy Saturday, but we know the story of the resurrection. And so it's easy for us to look back and say, I wouldn't have doubted. I wouldn't have been afraid. I would have been right there with Jesus to the end. Peter was so weak and broken. The others, terrified. One of the other things I like about Mark's gospel is Mark's the only one that includes the story of the young man in the garden who gets his loincloth grabbed by one of the guards and it slips off of him and he goes running through the woods naked away. Why does Mark include that story? Most scholars believe because everybody knew the story and it was actually Mark. So Mark tells the story of himself getting his loincloth ripped off and running through the brush. But back to today's gospel. Get behind me, Peter. You sound like Satan. You don't have any clue what God is doing here. Jesus speaks truth because Peter had no clue about what God's intent was. We said last week that Jesus reached that place where he set his face to Jerusalem and he was on the road. He knew where he was going through the time of his baptism. And now as we, we get closer to the end of that third year of Jesus' ministry and the Passover looms on the horizon, Jesus is en route. He knows where he is going and nothing is going to stop him. It's easy for us to say, look at Peter. He had no idea what was going on, but wait, Peter did. Jesus asked them, you've been listening. Who are folks saying that I am? What are those people saying about me? Well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're one of the prophets. Oh, What about you? Who do you say that I am? Who am I to you? And Peter answers on behalf of the entire group, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Other gospel writers at this point put in Jesus' commendation of Peter. You are right. You are the rock on which I will build my church. Mark doesn't include that part of the conversation. Mark just goes on to that next phase where after the confession, finally Jesus sees that they understand exactly who he is. Now you've got to remember it's been three years in their journey. They have witnessed all of the things that Jesus has done. They had cast out demons and healed people on their own. They knew. So Jesus stopped after this confession that all of the teachings, all of the healings, all of the miracles had come together in this ragtag motley crew of fishermen and tax collectors and others that they finally had an idea just what it meant to be Jesus. So Jesus begins to explain further. Not sharing with them anything new. This would have all been Old Testament history and tradition about what was to happen to the Messiah coming from Isaiah and Jeremiah's prophecies. Peter wanted nothing to do with that. Basically, Peter says, over my dead body, Lord. Well, Jesus then has to rebuke the crowd. Eugene Peterson, in his translation of the message, 
picks up the nuance of the Greek that the NRSV doesn't pick up. That when Jesus rebukes, he doesn't just rebuke Peter, he turns to the crowd and rebukes them all because he sees the doubt in all of their eyes. It isn't just Peter. Peter's the only one with the courage to speak. The same as we talk about Peter as he fails when he tries to walk on water. Peter's the only one with the courage to get out of the boat. We give grief to Peter as he denies Jesus three times inside the garden or the courtyard. But Peter's the only one courageous to be that close to Jesus in the first place. But how quickly it turns from certainty to uncertainty, from faith to doubt, from hope to hopelessness, from joy to grief, from laughter to sorrow, how quickly it changes for those of us that are human. Our journey of faith is just that. It is those moments where we believe beyond everything that we can believe in the truth and the promises of God through Jesus Christ. And there are times, maybe sometimes soon thereafter, where we doubt it all. Peter's story is a story for us all. The story of Cephas who becomes Peter the one who on, on which the church will be built, the one who just a few days ago was up on top of the mountain with James and John and Jesus as he was transfigured, who saw Jesus in all of his glory and says, we don't want to come down off the mountain. And he gets rebuked to come down off the mountain. The one who confesses Jesus as the Messiah and then the one who speaks like Satan. The one who says, I'll die for you, Jesus, and then fails Jesus in the end. The one who pulls out the sword and cuts off the ear in the garden only to be rebuked by Jesus again that if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. The one who swears his allegiance only for Jesus to say before the cock crows three times you will have denied me. The one who hides away in fear at the time of the resurrection but gets up and races to the tomb with the women to find that the tomb is empty, as they said. The one who goes back into hiding after the ascension. The one who at Pentecost preaches and thousands come to believe. The one later in the book of Acts, who as he walks down the street, people drag the sick just to be in his shadow because the mere shadow of Peter passing by gives them healing. Now, I'm not promising to you that you speak the word of Jesus and thousands will come to believe. I'm not promising that your shadow will heal hundreds. But I am telling you that your times of doubt and faith as they are intermixed are normal. The time in which you can look upon the cross and know that your sins are forgiven and the times that you think you couldn't possibly be forgiven. The times that you're on fire and wanting to do nothing but praise God and the time that your faith seems distant are normal. The time in which your heart aches to hold out your hand again to hear the words, this is my body given for you, this is my blood shed for you. And those times that you think, man, church on my couch in my pajamas is pretty good, are normal. The times that you cry out to God for healing for yourself or one you love and then curse God because the healing didn't have the answer you wanted are normal. They're human. They're as Peter. They're as James and John, the sons of thunder. They're as Mark and Paul. They're as St. Augustine. They're as Luther. They're as everybody who has gone before us, have had those moments where faith is so strong 
you could walk on water. In those moments where your faith is so shaky, you dare not leave the boat as you hang on for dear life. But here's God's promise. There are times where Jesus would have had every reason to wash his hands of Peter and the others. He never does. There would have been times that Jesus could have been able to say, listen, y'all don't get it, y'all don't understand it, I'm going to go find me a new 12 and we're going to try this again. He never does. There would have been times that Jesus could have said, get behind me, Satan, and stay away from me, but he never does. He keeps Peter with him on the journey, teaching, loving, forgiving, and encouraging all along the way. God's promise to God's people is to never abandon us. When we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is with us. When we are on top of the mountain where our lives seem like nothing can go wrong, God is with us. When we are somewhere in between in the boring normals of day-to-day life, God is with us. That is the promise of God not to abandon God's people in times of faith and doubt, in times of plenty, in times of scarcity, in times of joy, and in times of sorrow. God's promise is to be with us always to the very end of time. Now, we may not be the rock on which the church shall be built. We may not walk too far on the water. There may be days where our doubt is much stronger than our faith. There may be times where, as Luther talks about, at one and the same time, both saint and sinner, that the sinner overshadows the saint. But God is with us. As we journey with Jesus from where we are, Jesus meets us where we are. We may be suffering anxiety, discouragement over what's going on in the world around us. Our hearts may be broken. We may be terrified for what's going on in our lives. Jesus meets us exactly where we are, but moves us all to the same place. The rough and rocky road to the place of the cross, to the place of Golgotha. God leads us to the cross of Jesus Christ where we know God's grace and mercy. God leads us to the place of that holy emptiness of Saturday into the place of Sunday's joyful resurrection. God leads us to that place because Jesus meets us where we are, whether saint or sinner, whether faith or faithless, meets us exactly where we are and takes us all right here to where as the Roman centurion is the first to say, surely this man is the Son of God. In your Lenten journey, know that God is with you. Even if God feels miles away, I promise you that God is with you because if God does not keep that promise, then all of God's promises are in question. I promise that God walks with you in your sorrow in your grief, and in your joy and your gladness. I promise that God walks with you in your confidence and your fear. I promise that God is with you exactly where you are. And God refuses to give up even those times you weep. Dear friends in Christ, journey with Jesus. It's not always pretty. It's not always easy. And where we all end up is face down at the cross, crying out, surely this man is the Son of God. I invite you to stand as you are able as we confess our common faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. God of love, hear the cry of those who learn for love. Fractured families, broken homes, neglected, unwanted, alone. God of love. God of justice, hear the cry of those who yearn for justice. Persecuted and oppressed, exploited, ill-treated, broken. God of justice. God of peace, hear the cry of those who yearn for peace in battle zones and broken states, frightened, fearful, anxious. God of peace. God of healing. Hear the cry of those who yearn for healing, physical and spiritual hurting, weakened, depressed. God of healing. God of mercy. Hear the cry of those who yearn for mercy, convicted, in need of your grace, contrite, humble, bowed down, God of mercy. May you know the peace of God, the love of God, the justice of God, the healing and mercy of God, this day and always. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Before the benediction, one reminder, next Sunday will be Communion Sunday. If you are not on the communion list and wish to be, please make sure to contact the church office early this week so that we can deliver to you next week. As you go on your way this day, know that Christ goes with you, before you to show you the way, beside you to befriend you, behind you to encourage you, above you to watch over you. Let our Lord promise to each of us in our journey of life and faith, the place of the cross is to give us his peace. Amen. <laughs>